Hi, I'm Mark Cleggon and welcome to the Photographer Academy and today we're back with my series on Clock and Compass where we're looking at uh, lighting and where we position it and how we kind of set everything up. And basically what we've been talking about in the first film is we were looking right back to the basics where the camera position is always going to be at six o'clock, the subject is always going to be in the middle of the dial of the clock and then basically wherever we kind of position the lights is going to be on a certain place around the clock itself. Traditionally, as I kind of talked about before, it's either going to be in the four o'clock or in the eight o'clock position is going to be the most complementary position for that light coming onto the, sub the subject. Why? Because basically it will give us some illumination onto one side of the face and then allow the kind of the rest of the light to wrap itself around towards the face. Depends on where the face is positioned, but we'll talk about that in film three, of course. In this film, we're looking specifically at the powers and the kind of ratios. Don't get scared off. I'll explain that now in a minute. But basically what we're trying to do is kind of unravel these secrets to lighting. But really, they're just common sense. And it's just knowing how to kind of light in the same way each time. I often refer to this as souffle lighting. Why do I refer to it as souffle? Uh, well, basically, if you're a chef, one of the most complicated things to cook is a souffle and you kind of mix all the ingredients together and you do it in a certain way each time. You put it in the oven at a certain, a certain degree, you pull it out on a, cer a cer certain time and basically you're guaranteed to get the result. And that's what we're doing with the lighting. The clock refers to here as far as the positions, but in fact it can all be broken if we overpower a light too much where it starts to kind of bleach out some of the, hi the highlights on the hair, or on the skin, uh, if we don't reveal enough detail in shadow. There's lots of things that can break things. So what this film is going to do is really unravel the kind of the different power settings to get great results each time. Well, the first thing we've got to do as a photographer is choose our working aperture because of the aperture is really going to give us that right depth of field. And I never want the equipment to determine what I'm going to do as a photographer, whether it's in a creative way or in a basic way. So in other words, if I want to work with a shallow depth of field, I'm going to choose an aperture like 2.8 or f4, then obviously I'm going to have to minimize the power. If I'm going to work with apertures like 5.6 or f8, the traditional kind of apertures for kind of portraits and groups and so on, then that's going to give me enough depth of field from the beginning of the group to the back of the group to kind of have that in fo focus, of course. Once we get to f11 to f16, that's really kind of where we do have to control more and more of the depth of field, specifically with bigger groups when we're going to have perhaps a, a couple of feet difference between the front face and the back face. So all we're ever doing, remember, with apertures is faking the, <laughs> the, the sharpness of the image because really there's only ever one part of an image that is perfectly sharp. The aperture is basically doing the rest for us. So once we've decided on the aperture, I'm going to kind of fix it at f8 for us for now. So at least we can work everything from there. If you're a 5.6 photographer, that's your preferred aperture. That's fine. You just work it backwards. And the same if you're an f11 photographer, an f16 photographer, whichever you want to do, you've got to kind of work it from a fixed position. I often refer, refer to it as a kind of a seesaw effect. So in other words, if you imagine <laughs> you've set everything up around this point, once you start to adjust one thing or another, something's going to change and kind of kind of knock everything out of jilt as it were. So back to the basics. We're going to have a four o'clock position as far as the key light's concerned and that doesn't matter whether it's in a soft box, an umbrella or the hard flash. What we're really doing is, me is metering that light. Now for me I always have to meter with a flash meter here because I want an accurate reading each time. So in other words I would um, from where the subject is going to stand I would point this at the key light, the main light at this, at this point. Um, depending on whether you want the lumosphere out or the lumosphere in, the lumosphere in will give you a more accurate re reading, more directional, whereas the uh, lumosphere out will give a little bit more of an increase in exposure because it will kind of show a little bit of the shadow side, a little bit more of the highlight as well. So um, I'm going to take my lumosphere in and I would point this towards the key, uh, the key light and then I would pop the flash in whatever, whatever way and to give, give me the reading on here. If it wasn't f8, let's say it was 11, then I'd have to go to that flash, whether it's speed light or studio flash, and dial that down in its power until I got to my working aperture, of course. So once I've kind of got that set, I can basically switch that one off. Why? Well, I always want to measure one light at a time so I get a perfect, consistent accuracy each time I control my flashes and they don't contaminate themselves. So if we're working in the classic kind of style for a minute, the four light 
studio set up for a minute, we'd be having a fill light behind camera position. Um, we often refer to it as behind camera position, but in fact, uh, it's, it's on the side of the key, uh, the key light. So in other words, our key lights at four o'clock, our fill light would then be between the five o'clock and the six o'clock position, depending on how much of the wrap that we want. Remember, the fill light's job is to illuminate on one plane, wherever it is the middle of the photograph, a whole kind of, imagine a sheet of glass here, and its job is to illuminate the whole sheet, sheet of glass from the top corner to the bottom corner. So it's a very non-diffuse light, light source. Now, I mentioned the word ratios that will frighten many of you to death. So we're gonna kind of get away from that and we're gonna talk about the simple setups that you can guarantee good results. The majority of the time, the fill light is gonna be set much lower than the key light itself, between one and a third stops and one and two third stops difference. Um, obviously, the one and two third stops lower power will show less detail in the shadow area. So if you've got black clo clothing, like a suit or a graduation gown, um, obviously it's not gonna have quite the, den uh, the density relief in the shadow area to really show me the, de the detail. That's where most kind of working photographers work at around about a stop and a third uh, in, in the difference. If I want to work with kind of more power on the fill, fill light, it basically, as I said, will illuminate more of the shadow area and will start to create a slightly flatter and flatter image the more and more it becomes very, very similar to the key light setting with it. So if our key light is set to F8 and we want a stop and a third less on the uh, fill light itself, obviously what we're looking on here now, the first thing, if we realize that one stop difference between F8 uh, and the next lower down is 5.6, that's one full stop change. Then kind of the meter is gonna change in the third inc increments with it. As I reduce the power down, and again, I would meter towards the fill light with the key light off, of course, to kind of capture all the information, just the pure information from that um, flash itself. Then what I do is um, make, make sure I'm gonna get a reading of either F5, if I want that stop in a third, or 4.5, if I want the stop and two thirds. Remember the stop and two thirds less will create less detail in the shadow, whereas the stop and a third will create slightly more detail in the shadow itself. In the classical setup, the third light is gonna be used as the hair light, and that's gonna be positioned at one o'clock. But in fact, this is where it can all go wrong for many photographers because they don't fully understand about the amount of power and the effect it's gonna have when it reflects off the subject. Specifically, if it's bare flesh or if it's very light hair, like blonde or gray hair, even a bald head, um, that will really kind of overpower. And there's a saying that I'd like you to remember and think of when you're positioning or kind of setting the power for the hair light is that the light from behind will appear twice as bright. That's to do with the reflectancy. So in other words, if I measured my key light, my F8, that's my working aperture. Now I measure uh, the um, third light, the hair light, to the same exposure, the F8. What it would then do is appear, in fact, closer to F16 in its reflectancy. Now, if you've got very dark hair and very dark clothes and so on, you can kind of get away with it, but still you've got to remember that equation. The light from behind will appear twice as bright. So, rule of thumb says, let's turn it down. So, if I'm looking for a, a kind of a hair light to work with blonde hair or very, very light hair, I want to be work, working less power than the F8, and that's going to be closer to two stops less than closer to one to one stop less. So in other words, F8 is the key at the key light. Measuring for the hair, the hair light will be close to F4. If I've got very, very dark hair that I'm still looking for around about five, 5.6 or a little bit more to create the separation that we need. And again, it will slightly kind of change depending on the, su the subject's type of hair from a really kind of a thick af afro to obviously a very, very kind of thinning out old people's hair. You've got to think about the, sub the subject. So in this case, less is more. <laughs> in other words, less power on, on the light is going to give you more detail in the kind of the uh, areas of the hair and on the skin that we want to maintain. The fourth light in the classical setup is used as the background light, or it can be used as an extra kind of kicker light on towards the face. Traditionally, it's used to illuminate the background and it would be positioned just behind subject and it or off towards the side, kind of coming in towards the, uh, the background with the brightest point measured uh, behind the, sh the shoulder blades and not around the hair as so many 
people do it. If we kind of get the bright part around the top of the head, it starts to look like a halo and not quite right. So we want that illumination to be brightest point behind the shoulder blades themselves. And this again is where it can get a little bit complicated. And the reason being on that is that basically depends on the material that you're photographing against. It could be a white background, it could be a black background, and obviously both of those reflect the light in a different way. Obviously, a black background will absorb the light, whereas a white background will reflect the light quicker and it has less of an absorbency. So as a rule of thumb, you're gonna to have to kind of think about how much a background absorbs the light. For instance, a, vel a velvet background, a true velvet background, will absorb one and a half stops of light on the way in, and then one and a half stops of the light on the way out. So that's three stops. Now, when we talk about kind of what we're measuring for, really what we're measuring for is 18% gray. That's really what we're getting to is this gray tone. So when I talk about a three stop dif a difference, that is to get it to gray and not to white, of course. So as far as the background light is concerned, we need to decide on what kind of background we're gonna use. So first of all, let's think about the high key setup. At this, this case, this would be a white background behind me, and I would have pretty much two lights, one on each side, so I don't need a hair, hair light at position one at this stage. I need uh, one light positioned at the uh, two o'clock position, and another light positioned at the 10 o'clock position, and they both point towards the background. And that's to give me an even illumination across the whole background itself. Now they need to be powered two stops more, so they are kind of powered at F616. I'd have the meter against the background, I point it back towards the light, the light source, and that is what I record for, so two stops more. Any more than that, and it starts to add like a, a halo, a glow backwards, which isn't very good, it degrades the image. Any less than that, and the background is gonna be some form of gray, and it will print in some detail there, which isn't gonna be very nice, I promise you. When it's a black background, obviously, as I said, you've got to allow for some of the absorbency, but as a rule of thumb, allow around about um, three quarters a stop in and three quarters a stop out. So in other words, uh, one and a half more power to create the gray tone behind the, sub the subject with it. So in other words, if this was kind of coming in at F8, our key light expo exposure that we have, then I want one stop more of power would be metered, again, unless you've got a spot meter of flash. Um, I need to get it around about the F13 power going up to around the F14 maximum to create the, gr uh, the grayness. And that gives me either a stop and a third or a stop and two, two thirds. As I said, somewhere between a stop and a half is gonna be the right kind of setup for you. And that's basically the, set the setup in the classical way. So in other words, the key light sets your aperture, then the fill light is one and a half stops less than the key light. Then our hair light, our separation light, is gonna be between one and two stops less than the key, key light. And then the background, depends on what material we are, is either gonna need more power, i.e. white, to kind of make sure it's pure white, or kind of more power again to allow the absorbency of the material. It's a quick and easy way to follow, and pretty, uh, pretty much it's a guaranteed souffle every time you take a photograph. So you can see in this short film, really what we discussed is powers. The clock hasn't changed from film one. Why? Because once we decide on where the flashes are gonna be positioned for the effect that we're trying to create, then it's controlling the light source. Unless we take total control of the environment, we're really never gonna create the kind of portraiture that we want within our photography. Remember, as far as the lighting accessories that we use, whether it's an umbrella, whether it's a reflective umbrella where it bounces off it and then comes back onto the subject, it's a shoot through umbrella where it kind of passes through the material and then lands on the, sub the subject, a small soft box, a large soft, soft box, harsh flash itself, or a honeycomb effect. They will all produce a slightly different characteristic of the light, but that doesn't set its power. The power is set from the back of the unit where you dial up and down to get to your working aperture. Take total control, and then it all starts to kind of fit itself into great photography. See you next time. Bye-bye.